Shooting time lapses with Canon's consumer level cameras can be a frustrating process. You have to choose whether you want to shoot stills or accept a host of compromises to get a video file out of the camera. But that's not really the case with their cinema cameras. In fact, there are three different methods you can choose from to shoot your time lapse footage depending on your exact needs. And all of these produce video files with no other limitations compared to standard video recording. What's up, everybody? I'm Jason, and welcome back to some more tips and tricks for the Canon EOS R5C. For the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at time-lapse photography from concept to implementation, and ultimately we'll be looking at post-processing. And in the last two videos, I walked through shooting time-lapses using Canon's EOS R5. And of course, the R5 had some limitations, especially when it came to shooting videos in the time-lapse video mode. These limitations, interestingly, or fortunately, simply don't exist on the R5C. So of course, since the R5C has a photo mode, you can switch the camera to that and shoot still sequences with the highest possible image quality that the camera can deliver, 14-bit RAW. But the real beauty of the R5C and its Cinema EOS OS video mode is the flexibility available to shoot time lapses in video mode. So before I get to the mechanics of setting things up, let's quickly look at the major differences between the R5 and the R5C when it comes to shooting time-lapse videos. Now to start with, on the R5, you're limited to either 8K, 4K, or 1080p using a 16 by nine aspect ratio. You can't shoot in any of the wider 17 by nine aspect ratio DCI formats, even though you can with the normal video options. Now, this isn't the case on the R5C. In fact, since you can shoot time-lapse videos in RAW format, you can also use the native sensor resolutions, which are 8K, which you can do with the compressed formats as well, 5.7K and 3K for full-frame Super 35 and Super 16 formats. And that leads us nicely into talking about compression options. On the R5, the time-lapse videos are always compressed using the all-eye or intra-frame compression format and saved in either 8-bit AVC or 10-bit HEVC formats, depending on whether you've enabled HDRPQ. On the R5C, the time-lapse sequences can all be shot in both all-eye or intra-frame compression or IPB, which will be identified as long GOP on the R5C, as well as in RAW. In fact, the only format that isn't supported is HDMI RAW, as your external recorder is going to record whatever frame rate the HDMI port is currently configured for, even if you're trying to do something different on the camera. The same is true for chroma subsampling. While the R5 can do both 422 and 420 chroma subsampling, what it does is again tied to whether HDRPQ is enabled or not. On the R5C, the choice of chroma subsampling is handled the same way it is for every other video you shoot. You pick what you want when you set up your compression options. In fact, when shooting time lapses on the R5C, the camera really just behaves the same way it does when shooting normal content, at least when it comes to recording in image quality settings. But that's not the end of the story either. The R5C offers a lot more in terms of both time lapse frame rates as well as overall flexibility and how it can be controlled. So with that said, let's look at shooting time-lapse footage on the R5C. If you go looking through the menus on the R5C, you won't find a time-lapse movie mode. Instead, you'll have three different special recording modes that you can employ to shoot your time-lapses. These are slow and fast motion, interval timer, and frame mode. Now, which of these you'll want to use depends not only on the interframe timing that you want or the timing uh, interval time, uh, but the control of the way you want the camera to release the frame. So to start with, let's look at slow and fast motion. Now, I think most people think of slow and fast motion as being where you go to shoot 120 frames per second slow-mo footage. And of course it is. However, it is much more capable than just that. You can, of course, use it for slow motion footage. However, if you choose a frame rate, a recording frame rate that's slower than the output frame rate, then you end up with fast motion footage, hence the name. And this can be set to uh, up to a level of time-lapse speeds. 
Now, if your recording frame rate is only slightly slower than the playback frame rate, such as say shooting 20 frames per second in a 24 frame per second instance, then what you're doing is known as undercranking in the trade. And this is a technique that's often used in fight and action sequences to speed up the action and make people look really confident or even superhuman. However, the slow and fast recording frame rates don't stop there. They go all the way down to one frame per second. And that these very low frame rates stuff in the one to four frame per second range where it's useful for shooting time-lapse footage. Now to put the camera in slow and fast motion mode, you have a couple of options. First, you can head over to page two of the recording and media setup menu page and change the recording mode setting there to SNF motion. You can also do this through the direct touch control interface. Tap the direct cut touch control button in the bottom left corner of the LCD, then the recording setup icon in the top left corner. Then you're looking for the top left button on the first page, which is your recording mode setting. Change that to SNF motion. Finally, if like me, you find yourself switching to slow and fast motion a lot, you can program a button to directly toggle into and out of slow and fast motion mode. You do this through the assignable buttons menu, find a button you want and set its function to SNF motion. Once you're in slow and fast motion mode, you're going to want to set the slow and fast motion frame rate to something in the one to two second range. Well, at least if you're shooting a time lapse. These of course correspond to an interval time of one second and one half of a second respectively. Now again, to do this, you have some options. In the camera menus, you'll find this on page two of the recording slash media setup menu under slow and fast motion frame rate or slow and fast frame rate. You can also change this in the direct touch system. Here again, we're gonna go back to that recording setup menu and on the first page at the bottom of the right-hand column, you'll find the slow and fast motion frame rate setting. Finally, again, if like me, you use this a lot, you can program a button to directly allow you to change the slow and fast motion frame rate. To set this up, you'll want to head over to the assignable buttons menu, find the button you want to customize and change its button function to slow and fast motion frame rate or SNF frame rate. Now to use this button, you press it once to highlight the selected or the slow and fast motion frame rate. It'll turn amber in your display and then use the command dials to change the frame rate to the frame rate you want. Now, when you've set the frame rate to the frame rate you want, press the set button to save the setting. Otherwise, the camera will revert your changes when you go to shoot. At this point, starting and stopping a recording with slow and fast motion is identical to normal recordings. Press the record button to start recording, press it again to stop the recording. If you use shutter angles in conjunction with slow and fast motion shooting, the camera will calculate your exposure time based on the slow and fast motion frame rate, not the playback frame rate. So if you have your camera set to a slow and fast motion frame rate of one frame per second, 180 degree shutter angle will give you a half second exposure time. Additionally, you can also use the slow and fast motion with audio recording mode here as well if a sound file would be useful for your shot. You do note that after 60 minutes, the audio will stop recording, but the video will not. Now that said, while slow and fast motion is a good place to start, one thing you've probably already noticed is that the time-lapse frame rate options are kind of limited. Only really one or two frames per second makes a lot of sense for what most people would consider a time-lapse shot. And while you certainly can speed things up in post from a one or two frame per second starting point, if you know that you need a faster speed out of the gate, then this probably isn't the best way to go about doing things. That brings me to the next option, the interval recording mode. Now at first glance, this seems a lot like the time-lapse setting on the R5, or really any other interval recording system. When the camera is set to this mode, you can specify an interval between shots. But where the R5C's interval mode differs from what you might expect at least is that you can also specify the number of frames to be taken at each interval. Though, to be honest, I have not found a real use for this setting in time-lapse photography or for that matter, anywhere else. Switching to the interval recording mode is done basically the same ways as it is for slow and fast motion. You can either use the menus or the direct touch system. However, there isn't a direct button option for the interval mode the same way as there was for slow and fast motion. Now, setting up your interval recording session is also done either in the standard menus or the direct touch menu system. 
In the normal menus, the relevant settings are found at the bottom of page two of the recording slash media setup menu. There are two options there, interval rec colon time interval and interval, interval rec frame rate. Now, if you're going through the direct touch system, the two settings will also be on the first setting of the record settings direct touch menu. So what do interval and frame rates do? Well, if you look in the manual, Canon doesn't do the greatest job of explaining it. So I'll try and do that here. Interval time is pretty obvious and self-explanatory. It sets the time between frames. Now, I put frames in air quotes here because each frame can actually be a sh burst of one, three, six, or nine actual individual frames, which are shot at the camera's configured recording frame rate. You can set the interval time to a series of predefined settings. These are one, two, three, five, 10, 15, and 30 seconds, and one, two, three, five, and 10 minutes. Now, the second setting is the interval rec frame rate. And this is not really a frame rate. Rather, what it is, is, is a number of frames that will actually be shot in each interval or triggered after each interval. So you have the option here, as I mentioned, of one, three, six, or nine frames, and those frames will be recorded at the frame rate your camera is configured to. Now, I'll be honest here, and maybe it's just me, but I don't quite see the purpose of this interval frame rate setting. At least it's not something that I think you'd want to use when shooting an interval, uh, a time-lapse movie, so you're probably going to set this to one. And in any event, once you're in interval mode and you set up your interval time and set the frame rate to one, INT, in all caps, INT, will blink at the top of the live display and in the bottom right corner of the top LCD to indicate that the camera is in interval, interval mode. From here, you can start your recording simply by pressing the record button on the camera. And of course, you stop the recording at any time by pressing the record button again. If you use shutter angles when shooting in interval mode, the camera calculates the exposure time based on the playback frame rate, not the set interval time. So if you're shooting at, say, a one second interval, but you're playing back at 24 frames per second, set with 180 degree shutter angle, the camera will use 1 48th of a second as the exposure time. Now, compared to slow and fast motion, the biggest benefit of the interval mode is that it lets you record time lapses with larger intervals. Additionally, interval recording mode, like the standard slow and fast motion mode, doesn't record sound either. Now, the final recording mode that's useful for time lapse shooting is the frame mode. Now, if you've ever done stop motion animation with a Canon cinema camera, you probably have already used this. If not, frame recording works completely different from the normal recording modes on the camera. Instead of the record button starting and stopping a recording that runs at some pre-specified frame rate, the record button simply triggers the camera to save a frame. You can spend however much time you need between frames to make your adjustments and then trigger the next frame. So given that, why would we even consider the frame mode at all? And the short answer to this is that you can use an external trigger to control your recording. Now, this could be something as simple and perhaps even silly as hooking up a Canon TC-80N3 remote timer release to the remote release port and using that like you were shooting stills, or it could be something more sophisticated. For example, most of Edelkron's motion control gear has a time-lapse mode that can trigger your camera at a specified interval. Normally, you would work this with a st uh, still images, but on a cinema camera, you can actually use the frame mode and have it trigger and make a video right in the camera. Now, I should note, this isn't a perfect solution. It works well with some hardware, but not all. For example, my DJI RS3 Pro, which can communicate with the camera and can even trigger the shutter release in still mode, cannot trigger the frame recording option. However, devices that simply interface with the N3 port, such as Edelkron's motion control hardware, will be able to trigger each frame. Now that said, we'll get into all the gory details of shooting hyperlapses with both Edelkron's motion control gear and DJI's RS3 Pro in a future video. Back to frame recording. This also works differently from the standard video recording modes in the, and even the two special modes that I talked about when it comes to actually how you record. So enabling frame recording is done the same as the previous other two options. You either go through the second page of the recording setup menu and or through the direct touch control menu. 
This time, of course, you're looking for frame option or the frame option in the recording mode list. Additionally, there is a single configuration option for the frame mode that is similar to the interval timers frame rate setting. That is, you can choose to have the camera shoot a burst of one, three, six, or nine frames every time you trigger a recording event. Also, like the interval timer, the frames are recorded at the frame rate that's set for your normal recording rec settings. Like with interval recording, if you are shooting with shutter angles and using the frame recording mode, the camera will calculate your exposure time based on the playback frame rate, not how long it takes between each frame. So again, if you have your camera set to say a 60 frame per second flip playback rate, then the camera will use 1 1 20th of a second as the 180 degree shutter angle exposure time. So once frame rate recording is enabled, FRM will flash in the top of the LCD display and or the top of the live view display and in the bottom right corner of the top LCD. Now here's where things get a bit weird. The first time you press the shutter release, a frame is captured and the recording starts. FRM will stop blinking and stay solid. A red record indicator will appear next to it on the displays and the tally light, if enabled, will turn red. Additionally, to the right of the red recording indicator, the camera will present this text STBY or standby in green. Now, the red recording indicator and the standby text indicate the camera will now record a frame anytime the record button is pressed. Now, that record button could be the shutter release, any other button you've defined on the camera to start or stop movie recording, or something plugged into the N3 remote release port. Now, the weird part here is how you go about stopping and saving the recording. You can't just press the movie record button as you normally would, since that would just capture another frame. Instead, you have to go into the camera menus and change the remote recording mode to one of the other recording modes, for example, normal, for the camera to save and finalize your video file. You can also finalize and save your video clip by turning the camera off with the power switch. Also note, you can't do this through the direct touch interface as that is completely disabled once you actually start frame recording. And with that, we come to the end of looking at how the R5C handles shooting time-lapse videos. And of course, this is a Cinema EOS OS thing, so this does apply to Canon's other Cinema EOS cameras. If you found this useful, let me know by hitting that thumbs up button and sharing this video. If this kind of thing seems like it might be your kind of thing, please consider subscribing if you're not already. Also, if you'd like to directly support this channel and future content like this, please consider hitting that thanks button if you can, or buying yourself something you've always wanted from one of the affiliate links in the description. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.